This particle image animation effect literally got me more questions when we launched Frontend Expert than the actual product did. But honestly, I was just as impressed when I saw it as some of you were. I actually had nothing to do with creating that effect whatsoever, but let's see if we can go ahead and recreate it today. First, of course, we need an image, so I'll use this picture of these puppies. That way, when my code inevitably doesn't work, I'll at least have some cute dogs to look at to calm me down. Now, in order to get this effect, where the image separates into individual particles, we need to divide it up. So we can add some arbitrary grid over the image and make each cell a portion of that image. Then we will animate each cell individually to represent the individual particles. We could try creating an image tag for each particle and then using some CSS to hide all of the image that isn't part of the particle. But having hundreds or thousands of image tags in the DOM sounds potentially problematic. Hmm. I think a simpler approach might be to use a canvas as they're basically made for more complex graphics like this. And in the canvas, we will just create a 2D grid of circles, each circle being one particle. Then we can set the color of each circle based on what color it is at that spot in the image. Okay, so let's give this a try. First, let's create an empty canvas in HTML, and we can get the 2D context off of it in JavaScript since we're working in 2D space. Next, we need to figure out what all of the different colors are in the image. There's no super clean way to do this, at least not that I know of, but let's start by just creating an HTML image element, which is just an object representing that image with the image constructor. And then we can set the source of that object to the dog's image, which I have saved in this dog's JPEG file. Then once the image is loaded in, we need to get the data of what colors are at each location in the image. The best way to do this that I know of is to first just add it to the canvas temporarily, and then we can get the colors from the canvas. So let's add this load event listener to the image. And when it loads, we can simply draw the image. We'll also want to make sure that the canvas is the same size as the image. And now to actually get the data out of the image we just drew, we can use this get image data function. This function takes in the X and Y coordinates of the top left of the image, which will both be zero. Then we also need to pass in the width and the height of the image. And the return value will have a data property, which is essentially just our image represented as one giant array. Each pixel of the image has four values in this array for the red, green, blue, and alpha values of the color of that pixel. Now we could just convert each pixel into a particle, but I think that'll give us way too many particles to actually animate at once. So instead, let's just choose some arbitrary particle size. So I'll say that each particle has a diameter of six pixels. And now given this diameter, we can actually calculate the number of rows and columns we are going to need. To be careful, I'll round these values, but assuming that you choose sizes that are divisible by each other, that shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so let's iterate through all of the rows and columns and create a particle for each cell. Each particle is going to be a single color, even though there's actually multiple pixels within each particle and they could have multiple different colors, we'll just pick one. This will pixelize the image a little bit, but I think that's fine given the effect that we're going for. So from our image data, we need to find one of the pixels that is in this particle and use it to choose the color. And remember the image data is a one dimensional array, even though we are creating a 2D grid for the image. So we need to convert our row and column into a pixel index. For that, let's take our row and multiply it by the diameter of our particle and by the image width. This will account for all of the pixels from the previous rows. Then we can add to that the column multiplied by the particle diameter to shift it over by how many pixels we've already used in this particular row. Then because there's four entries for each pixel to represent the red, green, blue, and alpha values, we can multiply this whole thing by four. And finally, with this index, we can get the red, green, blue, and alpha values for this particular particle. For simplicity, let's create a global array to hold these particles. Each particle will just be an object with the current X and Y values of its position, as well as we also need the origin X and Y values. Initially, these will be the same, but when we handle mouse movement, the current X and Y values could potentially change, making them different. 
And then we also need the color, which we can just store as a CSS RGBA string. And now with the particle array finished, let's draw the particles to the screen. So I'll create a new function for this called draw particles. First, let's just clear out the entire canvas of any previous values. Next, we can iterate through each particle and create a path for each one. We want the particles to be circles, so we can create an arc for this. This will take in the x and y position of the particle, and then the radius, which is going to of course be the diameter divided by 2. Finally, we need the start and end angles in radians. So to draw a complete circle, we start at 0, and then we can end at 2 times pi, which is the radians equivalent of 360 degrees. Then we want to set the fill style to our particle color, and calling the fill function will actually draw the particle path to the canvas. Awesome, so now we seem to have the particles, so let's move on to handling the mouse movement. So first, let's keep track of where our mouse currently is in the canvas with an x and y position. Initially, I'll just set these to be infinity to show that it isn't in the canvas yet. Then on mouse move, we can update the values to offset x and offset y. And on mouse leave, we can set the values back to infinity since the mouse no longer is over the canvas. Next, before we draw the particles, let's first update the particles array based on where the mouse is with an update particles helper function. For this, let's just iterate through each particle. And for each particle, if it is within some distance from the mouse, we want to repel the particle away. We can calculate the distance from the mouse by simply taking the mouse's x and y positions and subtracting from them the particle's x and y positions. Then we can break out that old distance formula that we were all forced to learn in school and we thought we'd never use again. That'll be the square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. Now, not all particles need to be repelled, just the ones close to the mouse. So let's define some arbitrary repel radius for how far a particle can be away from the mouse while still getting repelled. For now, I'll just set this to be 50. So if the distance from the mouse is less than this repel radius, then we want to calculate a new position for the particle. For this, we need to figure out how far we need to move it and in what direction. For the direction, we can break out even more math we thought was useless, starting with the arc tangent. We can use the arc tan2 function, which takes in a y value, then an x value of some point, and it finds the angle to that point from the origin. So if we pass the distance to the mouse, we can actually get the angle between the particle and the mouse pointer. Next, let's say that there will be more force the closer the mouse is to the particle. So force can be the repel radius minus the distance from the mouse, all divided by that repel radius. So for example, if the distance from the mouse was 49, the force would be 1 divided by 50. On the other hand, if the distance from the mouse was only 1, the force would be 49 divided by 50, which of course is much larger, which is what we want it to be. And now we need to actually calculate how much we need to move the x and y values. We can use cosine and sine to get the x and y movements along the unit circle. Then we just need to multiply those values times our force to get the total amount that the particle needs to move. And then we can simply subtract these values from the x and y values of a particle. But we also need to make sure that this gets repeatedly calculated, not just once. So let's add a request animation frame to the end of draw particle to recursively call itself for the next frame. It's worth noting that this could mean that the result will be slightly different depending on the speed of the user's computer, but I think that's fine as it's likely going to result in it being much smoother than it would be if we hard-coded a frame rate. Awesome. So this is working, and we can see the particles slowly repel from the mouse until they are outside of the repel radius. But let's make it go a little bit faster. I'll add an arbitrary value for this, this time for a repel speed, and we can multiply it by the move x and move y values to increase the speed. That should make things a bit faster. Nice. But now the particles are never returning to their original positions. So let's add an else if for if the particle is not in the repel radius, but it is also not where it is supposed to be. So we can just check if the x or y values are different than the origin x or y values, meaning that the particle has been moved. In that case, let's do essentially the same thing, but in the opposite direction. 
So we can still calculate a distance, but this time from the origin x and origin y values. We can then calculate the angle, move x, and move y values in essentially the same exact way. Then we can add our move x and move y values to the particle x and particle y values. Nice, that seems to work pretty well, but this time it seems way too fast. So let's add a return speed as well. This one will be a decimal to slow it down, so let's say 0.1. And of course, we can multiply the speed by the move x and move y values. That looks a lot better. On front end expert, there's also this animation when the page first loads. For this, let's just change the initial x and y values to be some random values. Then our update particles function will naturally move those particles back to the origin x and origin y values. So initially, we can just put each particle at a random location anywhere in the canvas. This is a bit different than the front-end expert animation, but it actually looks pretty nice, so let's just stick with it. There's also probably some performance improvements we could make to not recalculate every single particle on every animation frame, but this is working fine, so I'll leave it for now and make that an exercise for you. And of course, if you are looking to improve your front-end skills or study for front-end interviews, make sure to check the link in the description to Front-end Expert. There's a lot of cool stuff on there beyond just this header animation. Otherwise, you should watch this video next, where I create an entire Tetris clone in React. I'll see you there.